I love the story about the uh, seven-year-old Sunday school boy who came home and his mother asked him, well, what did you learn today? And he said, well, Mom, you know the story of Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And you know how they got down to the edge of the Red Sea. And Moses realized that there was no way to cross over. So Moses called on the Israeli Army Corps of Engineers and had them lay down a pontoon bridge. And the Israelites crossed over on the pontoon bridge. And just as they got to the other side, they looked back and saw the Egyptians who were pursuing them at some distance arrive at the edge of the Red Sea that the children had just left from. They had their guns and their tanks and their artillery, but as they got it to the edge of the water, everything sunk in the mud. So Moses called up the Israeli Air Force, and they took care of the Egyptians. Oh, Mom said, You can't tell me that that's really what the Sunday school teacher taught you. Well, not exactly. But if I said what the Sunday school teacher really taught us, you would never believe it. First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-five says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. This is an excellent text, I think, to keep in mind, because you and I operate all week long in a very secular world. And it's not impossible for us to come Sabbath morning, no matter how dedicated a Christian you might be, and you listen to a story being related, and you say to yourself in your heart, is that really true? Well, it's not just us in the 21st century that sometimes ask ourselves that question or find ourselves asking that question because Genesis records the story of another birth than the one we're celebrating today. And you know how it goes. Abraham has three unusual visitors one day. He arranges for food to be prepared and he visits with them during the meal. And uh, his wife, Sarah, is kind of hidden but able to hear the conversation among the four men. And then she hears one of the men promised Abraham that he would be back in a year's time because they would have a little boy by then. And it's too much for Sarah. Hidden though she may be, she's chuckling to herself. She says, I'm way beyond childbearing age. My husband is an old man. Indeed, he was. He was a hundred when Esau, when Isaac was born. But that birth to this astonished couple was 
so great, made such an impact that they called their son Isaac, which means the one who laughs. So that as long as God gave them time, they could remember these words, the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God stronger than human strength. But of course, the greatest and most incredible story of all in the Bible is surely the one we're considering today. There is absolutely nothing in human experience that can uncover for us any sense of identity in the words that the Apostle John uses in just a phrase that is found in John 1.14. The word became flesh. John's introduction to the life of Jesus starts with Jesus in eternity. The same Jesus who is on this earth, who grew up in a typical home, developed a circle of friends, ministered to the needs of others, and eventually was executed by an oppressive government, turns out to be the one who created the universe and everything that's in it. More mind-boggling yet, he has been God's equal and companion throughout eternity past. When we consider the babe of Bethlehem, we are thinking about God as fetus. Holiness in the womb. The creator of life being created. Now, had we had the charge of taking care of this baby when it was born, I think, speaking for myself, of course, I would have put him in a palace. Everything would have been sanitized. There would have been silk sheets. There would have been hot and cold water. There would have been a nurse on hand and a doctor nearby. But Christ, though God, his birth was in a stable of 2,000 years ago where the stench of urine, dung, and sheep reeks pungently in the air. The ground is hard. It has not been swept. Cobwebs cling to the ceiling, and a mouse scurries across the floor. The shepherds to whom the angels sang are watching Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. And I dare say that Joseph was having a very hard time staying awake, quite frankly. Now that Mary was in good shape and the baby was healthy, he, having just walked leading the donkey on which Mary was, was uh, riding for 70 miles, finds it's so easy to lay his head against the wall of the stable. And pretty soon those eyes are closed and he's asleep in his exhaustion. But Mary, of course, is glowing as she takes care of Jesus. And the shepherds who are still wondering about the angel's announcement are staring wide-eyed at what is going on with the baby. 
And recently, the pastor of the Boulder Adventist Church, in his daily de devotional, made reference to a study by two men who uncovered that the shepherds who worked in the uh, temple courts and prepared the animals for sacrifice would take a newborn lamb and they were very careful right away to wrap it up in swaddling clothes in order to keep the legs from kicking and injuring the animal. And here they watch Mary wrap Jesus in swaddling clothes and place him in a manger just as the newborn lamb was placed in order to protect it from harm's way. The only real difference between what they had witnessed many times in the temple courts and what was happening that night had to do with the who was being put in the manger. Even in those few moments, outside of Mary's womb, Jesus was being prepared for his role as the sacrifice, sacrificial lamb of God. God as fetus. Holiness in the womb the creator of life being created. And now, the sacrificial lamb of God. Is that foolishness? Or is that a demonstration of the infinite wisdom and love of God? Way back in 1994, soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union, two Americans were invited to take their Christian principles to the country of Russia to address students, to um, address the uh, firefighters and the police, and share with them the principles of Christian ethics. Finally, they found themselves in an orphanage in which there was a hundred children and who had been abandoned and some abused, somehow ended up in the care of the government. And there they decided to have the children involved by uh, making a little manger. They had told them the story of Bethlehem, and they had three pieces, small pieces of cardboard for each child. And they had some yellow strips of paper, and they had cut up a garment so that there would be a little blanket, and each, and then uh, some tan um, felt was cut up to resemble a baby. And there, the children assembled their own little manger. And the two Americans walked around watching the assembly going on till eventually they came to a little boy who may have been no more than six years old. And there they notice that he doesn't just have one baby in the, in the manger. He has two. They call over the translator and they ask, listen, why does he have two babies in the manger? And uh, as the translator recites in translation what the boy is just saying, they recognize that he has learned a lot, probably knew and didn't ever knew the story, and he was very faithful to all that they had related until he got to the point of describing the manger. And then he made a switch and 
started to uh, ad lib. And the uh, little boy said, well, this is what happened. Of course, one of those babies is indeed Jesus. But he said to me, do you have somewhere to go, to live? And the little boy said, no. I don't have a mama or a papa, and I have nowhere to go. Nowhere where I belong. And then he went on and he said, uh, Jesus was just listening to me and, and I, 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 I wanted so badly to be with him and I wanted him with me and, and yet I had no gift to give him. So I asked him, as I thought about it, I said to Jesus, I have no gift to give you. Before Jesus could reply, the little boy said, but would you mind if I kept you warm? Would that be a good gift? And Jesus said, that's the best gift I have ever received. Yes. That would be a wonderful gift for me if you could keep me warm. And so the little boy said, I put myself in the manger with Jesus. And then he bowed his head and started to weep and tried to mutter through those weeping tears Jesus also said that in providing this gift of warmth to him, he was assuring me that I would always have a place forever. And I hope that as you go home and you celebrate Christmas, you will realize that what Jesus did for each of us, is forever. I invite you to uh, bow your heads while we dismiss. Gracious Lord, you are immense, incomprehensible, wondrous gift of Jesus as a baby. It's something that we are fortunate enough to know about and to celebrate. Maybe sometimes it takes on too much familiarity. As we go our separate ways, enjoy our times with family and friends, we pray earnestly that Jesus will continue to be in our hearts because it is in him that we have a forever. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Merry Christmas, as our youngsters said so well this morning. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your presence. God bless.